Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today I'm very excited to bring you the experiences of the person who has playtested more Path of Magic than anybody. I have really never imagined that somebody would die over 800 times before it was even released. And I must commend you on this supreme achievement. Well, I was shooting for a thousand, but I couldn't make it. So why don't we start with, how did you find out about this? I played on your death server, or the adventure server, as you called it, which is essentially a death server. But I don't know how I found it. I found it on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, and then you had the information at the comments or whatever, and I just logged into that. And when I was bored, I would log in and go run around in your death server and see how far I could get. So just so the people watching know what that is, it was sort of like the whole thing was a dungeon and had a bunch of secrets and things trying to kill you and traps. And it originally started as like a reason to have magic combat. But that's the context. That's what he's talking about. So you saw that and then you came here. But th this is very different than that, isn't it? In some ways, yes. I mean, you have it on hard settings. So in some ways, it's kind of similar. I guess the death part is similar. Yeah, I see what you're getting at. I, me I meant that that world would reset, whereas this one, you can actually build things in it and they stay there. Yeah, as long as you don't get raided, fine. Or a Valkyrie doesn't come and destroy your house. Like the Citadel. They don't even know about the Citadel. No, they don't, they don't know about anything, really. So you got to explain all these things or start from the beginning where they came. There's a lot of context, but they can learn about it through your story, I think. So I guess there are a couple questions I want to ask about your experience on Palm. You know when you go out and you think something's going to happen, but then something else happens. I want to learn more about those moments, if they have happened. I think it was the Black Forest with the tomb wraiths that would hang out there above the crypts and the extra skeletons and things that are floating around. And then the starting on the server was a pain. Because I hate the beginning of the game. And then I found a copper dagger from one of the Path of Magic drops, and that made the game so much better because I had a dagger before I could even, like, mine copper. That thing's pretty good. The knives are really strong early on. So were, had you been, like, when that dropped, were you aware that things could drop? What was it like to get a drop in Valheim? Oh, that was completely weird. And then my first thought was, well, what else drops? So then I go kill more things and not, not get anything for a while. And then I got another copper dagger, and I'm like, okay, I have two of them now. I think that's one of the more common ones. Because we, we've, we've had to go, go through that, that system like three or four times and make everything less and less common, if that makes sense. I don't know how you control your ratios of what drops and what doesn't. That's, that's behind the scenes. Oh, I mean, you, you're, you've enabled a lot of that. You and teens have helped a lot. But yeah, that was the most surprising thing, I think, was the, the random things you get from either fighting monsters or building stuff or planting things or cultivating ground or leveling ground things. So that system is actually rewarding for doing things other than just fighting and getting monster drafts. So one thing I've wondered about that is, because it, it seems that with a lot of these features, it's not just about like making the feature, it's about figuring out how can the feature explain itself to the player when they play, even if they don't know about it. So could you share some times maybe where you didn't know about something and the way that it was explained felt confusing? I don't think there was any one moment that was confusing. If there was a question about something, generally the, the Discord had an answer relatively quickly, and it was a relatively simple answer. Yeah, I guess that's the benefit of people. The others have become quite helpful, because in the beginning people didn't know but now, like Pan, Pan and Teens and Star and you, you'll help like answer other people's questions about stuff. It's really cool because now, now I can like focus more on developing and doing these other things. Well, like in your Discord, you have system charts and it shows you the floor trade system and what you can buy for your coins and things. Um, the summoning system and things like that. And then everything else you've added after that. And then server... Info Maps has all the other things that you would need in there. Wow, that's completely different from when I started. 
but those were, if I had any questions, I looked in there for the answers and they were generally in there. Yeah. So it sounds like I, I should keep that in mind. So, so I shouldn't just make it so that the server itself teaches the players there, there should also be like, let's say extra reading because I, sometimes I trip out and it's like, it's so much fucking text, like to look at all of the changes, for example, that's like, I mean, you have to actually read like, I don't know, like 20 something different paragraphs. And like, I, in my head, that's more than people are willing to do. But it looks like that's like one way to enjoy the server is to like, you get to know how things work better. And sometimes you can't play, but you can read a bit about something and like it's beneficial, right? Well, like the first thing they get introduced to is the coin trade system, or I thought that was the first thing I found. And I never had to mine iron. I just bought iron. Like I never did a crypt for iron ever. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that. So did, how do you feel about that? Was it, how was your experience this time not doing crypts compared to doing crypts for iron? I don't like doing crypts for iron. I would always send the wife to go do it. So she would farm the iron and stuff. And then I would go wander off into the Mistlands as soon as I would get an iron sledgehammer. And that's how we played the game normally. So we could have an arbalest by the time we hit the mountain. I watched your uh, how to skip uh, things in Valheim. And I went, that makes perfect sense. I can do that. And then we had an arbalest by the time we left the swamp and got into the mountains. So there are things... That thing is insane, isn't it? Well, it works off bone bolts so why wouldn't you get it in like the swamp mountains area like the fact that it's gated behind this land seems silly but those are the things that you yeah those are the things that you've brought into the server that kind of makes sense that should be there and j just so people understand what he's referencing in valheim when you get the arbalest by the time you can get it you're pretty much in the Mistlands or just getting into it, right? Yeah. And at that point, you have the better Arbalest bolts. But there's actually two tiers below that that you can make, but basically they never get used by players for the most part because by the time you actually get it in practice, those things are irrelevant and you have a lot of black metal. So on Palm you can get the Arbalest earlier and a bunch of other things. In general, like the food progression starts way further along. Like I've just sort of accepted like that that's just how it is on the server. You kind of need the food progression to progress on the server, so the food should be ahead of where the player is, and it makes it a lot more tolerable to new players. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but some players, they get like... I, I guess I just have to accept that there are certain kinds of players that will definitely be alienated. So maybe I should be clear about how the server is in the first place. Some people, they feel like they have to progress all the way up to something. So they don't really like it when a server starts further along in progression. Because in their heads, it's like that means that it's going to end sooner because there's less to do later. But obviously, like on Palm, there's a, a bunch of things to do. And especially when there's other people playing, you can literally just go like, see what one of them is doing earlier in progression and stuff and like that uh, yeah if there's like a couple people online there's something to do when i used to play valheim more regularly um i felt that it became too predictable for me so i once i learned the mechanisms behind all the biomes and just by observing and sailing really i'm not even talking about when i was like world genning or even using dev commands or that sort of thing um it, it just felt like I, I don't feel that there is something that I can find because it's going to be more of these biomes, maybe with some interesting borders, and it would become too predictable for me, and then I would lose interest. So you can see how that has reflected here, where I, I make a point to try and make things very unpredictable. But sometimes I wonder if things are too unpredictable. So do you have any thoughts about that? I think I kind of found the same progression. And then we cranked everything up to max raids for a playthrough. So you get raided every 15 minutes and tried to see what that was like. And then you have to focus on different aspects of the game other than just building a house and going out and wandering. Now you actually have a, you have to protect your house from the things that are going to try and kill it. 
So we played on Max Raids for a while, and then we went to your server. Max Raids are fun. Because you have to protect your house, you have to build spikes, you have to collect stuff. And it takes away that repetitiveness of Valheim. Something else is going to happen. You're not sure what it is or when it is. It's kind of like the Palm server. You kind of think you know what's going to happen, and then you go around the corner, and there's three other things that you didn't think were going to be there that you have to deal with now. Or you try to run away as fast as you can. That's awesome. So when, when, when I did the Max Raids playthrough before this server, I found that it, it felt very forced, but I was also playing with somebody who didn't build at all. And on Max Raids, you basically, it's, a, it's like a building experience, right? Like you can't really, I mean, I guess you could, you could do it without building, but w would you say that playing on Max Raids encourages you to build or discourages you from building? It depends on how you build. Like, I'm not a fan of raising ground and making an impenetrable wall around the base, so I avoid that at all costs. So you actually have to use the mechanics in the games, whether it's the spikes, the walls, the ballistas, the fallen logs from the trees, and just leave those there. So the enemy pathing is kind of weird to give you more time to kill things. So I abuse all that stuff as much as I can. I'd say you use things. You're, you're very good at figuring out how to use different mechanics. It's very useful. I've learned a lot from seeing how you handle things, especially the boss fights. And they, these are all things we can get into. Uh, but before that, let, let, let's get at, into the, the trophy raids. So do you want to... Well, do you feel comfortable explaining to them how the raids work and the trophies in Palm? In Path of Magic, you put up trophies of whatever you've killed, whether it's Grey Dwarfs or Goblins or Wolves or Drakes, whatever raids are normally in the game. And depending on how many trophies you put up is how the time interval for the raid. So if you, for instance, put up 20 trophies, you're never going to stop getting raided by whatever you decided to put up, which is a great way to farm iron. If you need iron, you put up Goblin trophies. And you kill goblins to get black metal, and then you trade that for iron. So again, you don't have to farm iron ever again. You don't want to. It's funny how often another system gets referenced. So we, we also have to explain the traders because they, they don't know about that. But the, the idea with what, what Bell just explained is that uh, in normal Valheim, the raid system can be quite obtrusive to people, especially certain events like ground is shaking and these things. And I have a feeling what Iron Gate was really going for is to spice up the home building experience so that it's not as boring. And it, it just sort of the way they did it, though, is a bit too brute-ish, if that makes sense. It's too extreme. So, so players have like a distaste of it. But they do need something to, to sort of enrich their experience. So in Palm, there's sort of other things that we do to try and make things a bit more random so there's usually an assortment of things unfolding if you just wait long enough and especially if there's multiple players around but one of one of the systems that bal just referenced is a, a trading system so you can go to any diverger in the game and then give them something to get something exchanged for that thing you gave them so you sort of have to know like what the things are and this is where Val mentioned earlier, the Discord channel shows, it has these charts and shows some of this stuff. But is there anything that comes to mind regarding the, the trading system? Because, I mean, for some people, that'd be kind of, it's like controversial to be able to just like toss. Okay, first we'll talk about floor trading, and then we can talk about the Diverger trading. But how do you feel about the floor trading system? You mentioned you could get iron. Uh, differently than you're used to, and that was nice. Uh, are there is there anything else that comes to mind regarding the fact that you can get coins and then throw them in certain amounts to buy certain materials? Well, in normal Valheim, your coins just pile up and do nothing after you get your your I can carry everything belt. You kind of don't need them anymore. So having something to do with them is nice and having materials that you normally don't have access to earlier is even nicer if you know how to get coins like it was quicker for me to run uh what is it burial chambers and the black forest 
and steal all the coins from that and then go buy whatever I needed to get to the next part of the game that I wanted to get. Ooze bombs are really fun. Having access to those before you even got to the swamp is great. Uh, that's, that's good to hear because that, that was one of the, the my the things I noticed in my own Valheim playthroughs was that the, the treasure in the game, it just didn't feel worth it. It's like very one time. Like it's worth it until you get the belt. And then maybe if you like building and you want to buy some lights. But in general, the coins just don't, they don't have that feeling of like, ah, I should get these so that I can use them for something I don't even know that I want yet, but I will want and I'll be able to use coins to get it. Like that, that's how it should be, at least if you want the players to feel motivated to go get different stuff. And, and the great thing about messing with the coins and trying to make them more valuable and useful and practical is that the game already has so many ways that it distributes coins to the players. So just like Bal mentioned, one could go through circling crypts in the Black Forest and get coins that way or one could do something else to get coins. The first thing I bought with the coins was a, a cart, so I could haul more stuff around. But I didn't even have bronze yet, so it didn't matter. Yeah, you can summon, I think it's 200 coins, right? And you can summon a cart. And you get a little cart, and you can carry all your crap around. It was nice. I love carts. That, that, that was one actually one of the original experiences that like motivated me to, to make what turned into this server was the experience of like going down paths in video games from one place to another with a group of people. I don't, I don't know what would happen to me, but in different games, I had experiences where I was with like one or two other players, like people, and we were going from point A to point B down, down some path. And on the way, some like crap happened to us and we almost died. And for some reason, those experiences for me, it were like, I could barely stop laughing. I could barely sit still. Like I was so, I was so amused and so overjoyed. Um, and that experience then unfolded into wanting to be like, okay, what if all of Alheim was just along like one big path, pretty much. So you can just run down it one way or the other and like for me, that's more conducive to my mind than like going in portals and doing all that sort of thing. It gets me to like, I just don't like looking at the portal screen and the fact that it teleports me around and I get that it's convenient, but it just, I don't know. I feel like it blocks the depth that Valheim can offer, but maybe people don't have anywhere near as much time. How do you feel about portals? Fine for some things, but it takes away the the map in your head that you make of the game and all the different places. Like, for instance, when I first started on Path of Magic, I ran down the path a couple of times, and I'm like, all right, I know this path goes to here. If I want to get to this, I know it. I can get over there. I can get lost. And then as long as I know the path is somewhere this way, I can wander back and get back to my house or whatever it is. So you're always kind of lost, but you're not really lost because there's a path somewhere that you can get to. And then that keeps expanding the further you get in the game. So I'm at the point now where I can sail around a couple different continents. And as long as I can see a couple different landmarks of things that people built, I know where I am. Yeah, it's cool, right? It's like you, you, you learn a lot of the map that way. Yes. But that's all. All the video games have some type of pathing system and then later in the game, they'll introduce some type of fast travel system that you can access. But they always try to force you to find your way in the game first. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I think the only kind of fast travel or teleporting... Well, no, because obviously the catapults are like a form of fast travel. You've seen that. But, but the only kind of teleporting I think I'd ever be okay with in Palm, at least. There's these cross-server portals. So there's... Like, the thing is, right now, this is locked behind a client-side mod, so I won't do it. But if things change and server-side portals become possible not client-side, um, basically, they're 
they're portals that instead of you going into another like you logging out of the game and then joining another server you literally just go in the portal and then it connects you it shows the loading screen like the troll and all that and loads and you're in that other server now and then you can go back in the portal and go back to the other server you were in and for for me that is something that like i there's not very many things i feel like iron gate should really do i i really think they've done an amazing job and the only thing that i hope they do is stop paying attention to social media and stop like feeling like they have not done something incredible cuz so i i don't know if it's just the content i looked at but sometimes they they seem like i don't know like they don't feel like what, what they've done is amazing and like it's it's sad for me just seeing seeing that but but my point here is that uh they've things have changed a lot right and on path of magic we can we have the ability to try different ways of doing things and theoretically if things get popular enough and things get enough attention and people are able to use this sort of situation i'm not saying just with path of magic but in other servers and in other content then maybe iron gate like will implement things from what these sort of mods and quality of life stuff have done. Um, it, it, it's interesting to see how, how, how it all will unfold, or rather it's interesting to think about how, how it will unfold. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how has it been like for you? Because things, this isn't vanilla, but it is vanilla. So how, how would you explain how that is? Well, that was one of the, the neat things about Path of Magic is that you didn't have to have any mods. And one of my ways of playing was to try to see and how many see how many mods I didn't have to use to play your game. So right now, I think the only mod I'm really running is the... Uh, what is it? I don't even know. The inventory expansion mod. No, I don't even use Path from Containers. It's the the one that gives you all your armor in a little window. Oh, the the quick slots. Yeah, that's the only one I have. Yeah, but you don't need any any of these things to play Path of Magic. You could just log onto the server and, and do what you normally do and then see what's different. And then you're going to decide whether you're going to keep going or read the things that are different and then keep going. You know, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because... Players seem to, let's see, how do I put this? Uh, as I've mentioned before, it seems that a lot of server communities are quite, or server owners are quite controlling. And so players are used to having like a lot of oversight and control over what mods they have or don't have and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And I, it's been quite interesting on Palm because I will say that the people who play, I don't know if this is just lucky because you guys are, cool or something or what but that they're, they're very communal and they like share things and we don't considering how many ways there are on palm to grief people and kill people like i mean there's explosions that aren't normally there so they bypass pvp there's ways to blow whole areas up there's there's you can summon monsters and all sorts of stuff like there's there's countless ways to grief yet people I've never had an issue with that. Like the issues I've had before are like other players sort of being abrasive with each other and getting in fights when there were more players back in the beginning. But these days it's like shocking how well behaved everybody is. And it really makes me wonder if all of these like constraints that server other server managers often put on their players, if they're really necessary, because I have a feeling it might be harmful, at least from seeing how, like, the players on Palm, they have, like, mods. And sometimes, like, some players use mods that, like, definitely make the game way easier. And, like, at first, I remember when I saw people use Speedy Pass with the 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 speed setup higher. I was like, oh, I felt, like, left in the dust because I was still playing as a normal character back then, and then I got killed by the monsters. And I was like, damn. <laughs> but at the end of the day... If you force people to play a certain way, you're not really 
doing what Valheim is so good at doing, and that's its flexibility. So for me, I'd rather see the different ways that people like to play and learn about the mods that they just like basically have to use because that's how they play. They, they, they swear by those mods. And I don't find that it is beneficial to control people so much. If anything, doing that seems to promote a griefing mentality because then you get into territory where you might screw someone over accidentally or whatever and then incite some kind of retribution and like i know that sounds ridiculous but there's a lot of petty stuff like that out there in, in gaming culture and valheim is a sandbox game where you can go in and do a whole bunch of different things why are you going to set the rules of you can only play in this half of the sandbox but no just give them the, give them the sandbox and let them play I mean, there's combat, there's building, there's exploring, there's whatever you feel like doing. There's fishing. Like, you could have a character that all it does is, like, logs in and fishes. Like, who cares? Fine. The wife's brother logged in, and all he did was build storage containers on every house he visited. And that was his game. That was his fun. We didn't understand it, but we accepted it and just let him do what he wanted. I I'd like it if, like, when family visited, they built me cabinetry. Yeah, he never left the meadows. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Valheim players like that. Go on. Yeah, but why would you limit a sandbox game? That seems silly to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to really answer, though, because ultimately a game is just a series of limits, really. That's what makes it a game compared to what we're experiencing. So there's always going to be limits somewhere. It's just a matter of, like, what are the limits? But I, I, I totally agree with the the meaning of what you're saying because... Like that's something I've learned from Palm is that when you're developing and making features, you're better off making things that you're not even fully sure how the players will necessarily use them, but there's so many different ways for them to interact with each other. And it's like the more tools you give the players to create different circumstances that they enjoy, then the better because you'll find that the players make things that you could never even imagine and they're really cool and they you can only learn that if you give the players the tools to make it does that make sense yeah for example you gave you introduced a system in path of magic that made boats give you buffs and rested status and all these neat little things and i took the boat and I put it in my house. So now when I go to my house, there's a boat that gives me all these different things that you created. I don't think that's intended, but that's how I used it. Yeah, and that, that blew my mind when you showed me that. That was very cool. And also, great example. That's exactly what, what, uh, what I was talking about. And also with the boats, another thing that happened is that players... Like, ah, uh, yeah, for, for those of you listening, there's these, like, quest boats, basically. So you can do these series of events and then gather some resources, and then you get a, a special boat that's better than the normal version. So there's one for the raft, the car, the longship, and the drakar, or dracker, whatever it is. And the one he's talking about gives a rested bonus and I think, like, wind run. Um, so another thing that players would do is they would take the ships and like keep them at the shore. And like normally in Valheim, people will just have the ship and then they'll go away from the ship. They won't like keep bringing the ship with them to make sure they're close to it. But when the ship gives the player a rested bonus, then that changes. Suddenly the ship is much more relevant to the player. And I remember just like, when I added that feature, it was literally, uh, I was just like, ah, oh, that sounds funny. It sounds useful. I was imagining like sailing somewhere and like you're rested so your rested bonus doesn't go away because I've lost my rested bonus sailing many times. So I had this like specific scenario in mind and then we implement the feature and then it ends up causing something that is not what I thought about at all to happen. And you know, like that's, that's like one of the other game development experiences from the server is that you have to be open-minded to these things because if you think you know best, like I've made loads of stuff for Palm, but it really isn't like the best features are literally things that I just like feel inspired or I hear a player talk about something or they have an idea 
And then I just feel inspired and roll with it and then implement it and then forget about it. And then like it shows up later if it's a good feature, people f- use it, right? And it, those are the situations that make good features. Features. It's listening to your players, seeing what they're actually doing and developing stuff in response to what they do. But obviously, like normally, a game's already developed when people are playing it. So no, that was kind of a neat thing. Was entering the server when I did, when you were still building all the things and going, "Hey, it would be neat if this could happen." And then within twenty four hours, there was some type of thing that I was talking about. And then sometimes it would stay, or sometimes it would leave. It didn't matter. But just there was some there was interaction between what was happening in the game and the person developing the game. Yeah, and that that part is magical. To be honest, it's really. Uh, I, I think for both the the person who's playing and for the developer, that's magical because for the player they feel more connected because their their feedback is not just being listened to; it's literally being like implemented, <laughs> right? There's no other like there's no more listening deeper than actually trying the thing in the game, right? And that's what's so crazy about Expand World Prefabs is like you can run it on the server and then just players can like be like, oh, I've been having a problem with this thing. This keeps happening. And then you can literally just patch it like within minutes if you if it's simple and they know they, it's something predictable. So that that has been a lovely, lovely experience for, for me as well, personally. So... But we, we've talked about a lot of positive stuff, but I want to learn more about things that, um, yeah, things that are worse on Path of Magic compared to, like, normal Valheim. Is, it, is there anything, yeah, maybe something that, like, you feel like it's gone too far or... You know, you know what I'm getting at? I'm a bad person to ask for that because I like Dark Souls. And I like Demon Souls and Elden Ring and those types of games. So the more challenging it is, the more fun it is for me. Uh, okay, so, so you don't feel then that there have been things that have made it too easy? Um, the, the gambling system to make the better weapons. <laughs> yeah, empowering. Yes, em- empowering once you get to the end of empowering if you can ever get there those weapons are kind of silly yeah they're crazy right yeah they're absolutely insane but if you take those weapons into the boss fights they suddenly become relevant so i'm not sure I'm yeah not sure. that's the idea yeah i'm not sure how i feel about them right now because just running around the game with an empowered weapon takes away some of the challenge but at the same time i'm still running around trying to kill bosses solo so their challenge is still there. Yeah, it's hard to balance, right? Because I, I, there's things that could be done about that, like pretty simple things. You know, it could just change the level cap. So, so right now, just so those of you listening understand, in Palm, there's um, you can summon Diverger, and actually, you can actually see right here. This is the Diverger blacksmith next to his tough, tough Diverger blacksmith friend. <laughs> And you basically can have these guys empower your weapons. And when you empower something, it will double the level if it works. And if it doesn't work, it'll destroy it. So if I were to empower this black metal sword, level four, and it succeeded, it would be level eight. And so it ups the damage a bunch and uh, it makes the weapons much, much stronger, as he mentioned. Yeah, I think you should empower one right now. All right, so when you want to empower something, we're going to try and empower this uh, black metal pickaxe because then it gets more durability and stuff. That's good. So you place your chest, and then you toss the item you're going to try and empower, and then you either get unlucky and it explodes like that. It just exploded. Or it gets double the level. So you can see how this could very quickly go quite out of hand. And the max level on Palm is actually like, I don't know, 96 or something, which is crazy powerful. But what's it been like for you trying to get max level weapons? Oh, that's a fun gambling system. 
you go out and you collect your materials, you amass a horde of stuff, and then you go throw it and watch it explode, or not, and then do it all over again. I'm kind of wondering if maybe maybe it would work better if like the limit was level 32 or something instead of something higher. But also, I don't know, at the same time, some of these bosses, especially the fader fight, they're so challenging that probably the only way to actually kill them is to have like crazy overpowered gear. And so for me, it's like if we can give the players overpowered gear in some situations that's okay but the thing that the reason i like it is because it makes them go do like get a bunch of the piece they're trying to empower whereas normally they would only make that once so it like puts them out into the game world more and they can have a bit more flexibility if their favorite weapon is weaker now they can just make a bunch of them and level them up and like they'll probably get a stronger one. So I feel that it, like I'll probably just leave it how it is unless I start to see that the really powerful weapons are really like breaking things up for people. Well, that's the other part too, is you don't have to kill any of the bosses if you don't want to. You can with a group of people, or you can take the quest system that you have and collect a couple materials from whatever biome you're in turn it in, and then you get the the materials you need to progress to the next biome. So the boss system is completely optional. Let's see. So so do you think, is there is there anything you would recommend to people who, let's say someone's listening to this and they want to try Palm, do you have some tips or like guidelines for them getting started or like basic mistakes they might make or something like that? If you're going to start playing on Path of Magic, you need to understand the, the melee bubble system because that's going to save everything and make everything a ton easier. And you can explain how it works better, but if you ignore that system, you're going to have a very rough time. So what he's talking about is that Palm is, uh, it has the very hard modifier, so enemies can kill you really easily. But traditionally on very hard, enemies don't... Or Players don't really use melee, and for me, that's sort of a problem. I want melee to be viable, range to be viable, and magic to be viable. Problem is that magic is just so incredibly powerful. So the idea here is that whenever you block, you get the bubble shield, just like Bal is showing, except that's from casting the staff. But on Palm, if you block with any shield or unarmed or anything, as far as I know, you'll get a weak version of that bubble that will prevent you from being killed in one hit. So it basically gives you two, two shots, and that second shot will kill you if you get hit by a really strong monster. And that was a necessary change because without that protection, the server was too dangerous and people could only use Fenring and Staff of Protection and Magic pretty much. So the idea with the bubble system is to make it so that melee is more accessible and players who want to use heavy armor and all these things can get into that instead of just like feeling like that whole system is neglected. Yeah, as long as you're blocking or parrying, you're fine, as long as you have your bubble. is understanding that system and making sure you have a grasp of blocking and parrying. And as long as you're blocking and parrying, everything's kind of normal. Yeah, that way you don't have to deal with all of the initial monsters killing you so quickly because you don't even need to get some fancy shield, you know. So one of, one of the other things on Palm is that the heavy armor sets are changed so that they have more set bonuses. And I'm wondering, Bal, is there any particular heavy armor set bonus that comes to mind that you've experienced? Um, what is it? What's the heavy armor for the planes? Ah, the padded armor. Yeah, the padded armor armor, and having goblin sappers explode was hilarious. So when you wear the padded armor, it would make uh, the fuelings goblins either your friends and they would fight with you, or it would turn them into sappers and they would explode after like 30 seconds. That was a fun one to make. Yeah, and it did the same thing with seekers and the next armor, Terrapace. Yeah, I think those were 
those were my two favorite heavy armors. I, I see you using the mage armor a lot now. Yes, as soon as I hit magic in any Valheim game, I end up playing with magic because it's fun. It splits your resource system into two different things, so it makes everything easier. Yeah, I, I like I love that ebb and flow of like using stamina for a bit and then using magic for a bit. For me, that's fun. It like without that back and forth, I get like a little bored in combat if it's just stamina and then I run out of stamina. Like it like it it's still fun. I love combat in Valheim, but I definitely prefer what you just described. Yeah, having two different resource systems for combat is infinitely easier than relying on swinging a sword with stamina and then running with stamina and going, oh my god, I have no stamina, I'm dead. All right, so I'll give some recommendations too. For any of you listening, if you're interested in trying Palm, um, you can, especially if you're listening this long into the video, like you're, you're dedicated, you can just join it and then you can get the information by going to the channel section and enabling that. And then you'll have everything you need and be able to access all the Discord stuff and talk to all of us. And like I said, it's uh, it's free to play. You just join. And we haven't really had any issues with someone causing too many problems. But yeah, here, I'll show the one thing that players should probably know is that you can get a pile of 999 coins on the floor, right? Not the build item, the actual like lootable thing, 999 coins, right? And then you can go say and trader. That's how you summon other traders. And depending on where you summon them, then they'll be capable of different things. So that's how you get blacksmiths. That's how you get different quest boats and all sorts of other stuff. So if you, if you know the bubble blocking and the things that we've covered, and you know that you can just get 999 coins and summon a trader, which will then allow you to trade all of the other things that are useful. Um, this is a sort of a big part of gameplay on Palm is like making these little places in your base for like the blacksmith and other diverger. And it's been really cool seeing that players actually do that. Is there anything you want to say about the, the diverger? Um, you can increase the quality of your items and you don't have to repair as often, just like that. And now you don't have to repair your harpoon as much. And you can go on longer adventures. So he's, he's talking about the tempering system. And pretty much you get a blacksmith. And then you make one of those grinding wheels. And then for 99 coins, the blacksmith will quadruple the durability of one of your items. But in a way that um, it's not permanent. So once it goes back to its normal durability... It's just the normal item again. That was a really neat system I didn't think I was going to like. But I ended up liking it, and that's one of the more functional purposes of the divergers. It's funny how the, there's a lot of systems like that, myself included. Like The things that actually end up being really cool, they're, they're often not things I think are cool. It's just like some different thing. But then when I actually see how players use it, or how it unfolds it's it's really awesome and just to go back to that you have to you have to sort of be open-minded enough to let yourself to under to understand that your initial judgments about things are probably incorrect at least for me speaking from a development perspective i often think this is one thing really important this is not whatever and it ends up not really mattering no as long as you can separate yourself from the idea and not have that much attachment to it and try to shoehorn it into a place, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the open-minded part. And so, so if any of you are watching and you want to try Path of Magic out, then like I mentioned, you can just go to the Discord server invite to a server called the Poolside. And that'll give you all of the information that you need. Just keep in mind, I have just one spot on that server. There's two other content creators there. Crumbs, Captain Crumbs, who makes like these shorts about Valheim that are really like funny skits. I, I, I love his videos, they're really amusing. And then there's Splash, who does live streaming and other Valheim content. Valheim and also some other games. So if you're interested in being involved in our community, then you can join our Discord. And their server isn't open right now to other players, but you're welcome to play on Path of Magic. 
as you can see, there have been some new players dying on the path as we've been recording this discussion. So, anything you want to say, Val, before we head out? No, I think we're good. All right. It was really fun actually chatting with you and getting to know you a bit better. It was very easy. And thanks for all the awesome feedback because uh, you really have... Um, if it wasn't for people like you and some of the others who like play on the server, uh, there's no way I would have been so motivated to just keep working on this. It's just been remarkable. So I, I really want to thank you because I know, I know you're just playing a game, but for me, especially when you write out like a lot of information about the things that happened, it's really useful for me. So genuinely. You're welcome. I don't mind being a guinea pig. <laughs> you're a very useful guinea pig. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. And if you want to see more Valheim content, then consider liking this video or any other video about Valheim. <laughs> Did you kill yourself? <laughs> that, that caught me off guard. Nice. <laughs> and then Valheim will start dishing out the content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I feel like I have to do that now. <laughs> well, how can you have a fitting end? How can you have the player of 800 deaths not die at the end? <laughs> <laughs> you had to know that was going to happen.